from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon. good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress. And of course, we're thrilled at the size of the crowd today. Sorry we don't have a larger room. But on the other hand, uh, it's a wonderful topic. And we have an excellent speaker. And there's going to be lots of time for questions and answers. So I think everyone will uh, get the question about their particular state answered. Uh, the Center for the Book was created in uh, 1977 to help stimulate public interest in books and reading. Uh, we are the reading promotion arm of the Library of Congress. Uh, we also have centers in every state of the Union, so we have a special interest in states and in today's topic. Uh, we also are the uh, author people who work on the National Book Festival. And this year's National Book Festival, which the Library of Congress does with uh, First Lady Laura Bush, will be on the National Mall this year on September 27th. We hope that uh, you can join us. And we have our own take on Mark's topic. This is a state map that we hand out uh, in the Pavilion of the States. Every state is, re is represented in the Pavilion of the States. And each state has its own seal. And the kids, of course, drag their parents around to visit every state table and make darn sure that they get a stamp from the state. So this is our little piece of the state action that we're going to hear more about today. Uh, I'd like to thank not only Mark, our speaker, but also Arlene Balkansky, who is Mark's wife, who also is a Library of Congress employee. Uh, Arlene, where are you, Arlene? Are you handing out? She's in the very corner. Uh, she's pulling out chairs and helping in a general way. Uh, she's been at the Library of Congress for over 25 years. Uh, for the last year, Arlene has been a senior reference specialist in the Serial and Government Publications Division. Earlier, when working in the Motion Picture Broadcasting and Recorded Sound Division, she gave numerous publications on the cataloging of archival film and television and on the library's collection of Zora Neale Hurston's uh, ethnographic films. Uh, this is the book Mark is going to discuss today. It's called How the States Got Their Shapes. It's filled with anecdotal history. Uh, Mark, as you may have known, has been already been on CBS Sunday Morning. He's been on National Public Radio. And I know that several of you are here because of the advertising campaign. Uh, Mark is a playwright. Mark Stein is a playwright and a screenwriter. His plays have been performed off-Broadway and at theaters around the country. His films include House Sitter with Steve Martin and Goldie Hawn. He has taught writing and drama at American University and Catholic University, and he lives in Washington, D.C. Mark will tell us about the book. We'll have a chance to ask Mark questions, and then we will regroup for a book signing in this room as soon as he is through. It's a pleasure to introduce Mark Stein. Mark. Thank you, John, and I want to thank the Center for the Book for inviting me. I also want to thank the Library of Congress for enabling me to be invited, because if it were not for this institution, I don't know that I could have written the book. And so I just kind of briefly want to mention, before diving into uh, the talk about the book, just some of the different areas of this library that were so critical to me in, in, in creating it. Uh, the Geography and Map Division uh, here is just extraordinary, at least from the point of view of a researcher. Uh, if, if you don't know, it's just so much fun to go find it on the web. They have all these historical maps, an extraordinary collection of historical maps that you can pull up, zoom in, for me to be able to find place names from treaties and other documents that, don't, aren't, that aren't on the map today. And to be able to locate them on a historical map was absolutely critical to understanding some of the boundaries. And their reference division, I can't say enough about so clear my mind is going in there one day and saying, I'm just, I cannot find the reason 
for New York's logic in this dispute. And they said, we'll sit down and we'll, we'll see what we can find. They were like waiters. They were Four books were placed in front of And in no time, there it was in a book from the government printing office that probably pretty hard to find elsewhere. Uh, there's also uh, uh, something called the uh, ephemera collection, I believe is what it's called, uh, that had uh, tremendous nuggets uh, to understand the, the, the culture of the time in a particular locale. I'm particularly thinking about Louisiana after the Louisiana Purchase when all these French-speaking people who do not want to be Ameri necessarily choose to be Americans but suddenly Americans. I could find things in the ephemera collection. Likewise, after the Mexican War, the Hispanic population and that had not sought to become Americans, I could find things in the ephemera collection. It's very helpful for understanding what Congress was dealing with when creating a boundary in terms of this new population. Uh, and, uh, of course, the books, and uh, particularly with the, the, in the library. And uh, something John didn't mention about having my wife work at the Library of Congress is that uh, she has borrowing privileges. <laughs> and I cannot tell you how many times I'd send an email uh, uh, asking if you could uh, bring home, in one case I wrote it down here, uh, uh, original instructions governing public land surveys in Iowa from the Iowa Engineering Society. And a day or two later, there it would be. And in fact, that book had a, had a, had a very critical piece of information that I'd been searching for for, for quite a long time. Um, my, my interest in this topic goes back to my teens. I don't clearly remember in what order these two things happened, but I do remember, I grew up in Maryland, I remember that. And uh, I would see the map of Maryland in school day after day, and I remember at about the age of 13, looking at this map at one point and thinking, what is this thing? What, how did it get this shape? It's almost broken in two on the west and on the east. It, it's missing half a rectangle. What's that rectangle? It turns out it's Delaware. And I, I remember thinking then, do we really need Delaware? Maryland <laughs> wouldn't be that big a state even if it had Delaware. Why do we have Delaware? Uh, it was also right about that point when I was in taking geography in junior high school that my teacher, who, though this story may end up sounding somewhat critical of her, she was actually a wonderful teacher, would, but she, she, had a, she had a game we'd play. I loved it. She'd hold up shapes, states, no names, just their shapes, and we'd raise our hands and, and try to identify them. I can't remember how we distinguished Wyoming from Colorado because they're both rectangles. I think she just didn't have them in there. But, but you know, we could learn the shape of New York and, and the shape of Florida. Years later, I thought back on that. And I thought, what she was teaching us is, what is the shape of New York, but not why is the shape of New York. And that there's so much more value in learning why a set of conditions exist than simply accepting those conditions and committing them to memory. And in that regard, to know why Colorado is the shape that it is, why the lines are where they are in that rectangle and not five miles this way or that, can prove to be a very important thing to know. Uh, uh, so part of my motive in writing this book was, in playwright's language, a subtext, was to encourage readers, and particularly perhaps the younger readers, to, 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 to try to uh, glom onto that notion of asking why a set of conditions uh, exist. In the time we have today, of course I can't cover the, everything, so I'm just going to focus on four elements that influenced a lot of the shapes of the states that we have. Uh, and uh, the first of those elements uh, would be the American Revolution and the, and the difference in which colonies were created by the crown as opposed to the way after the revolution states were created by Congress. For the most part, they had the same kind of considerations on their plate and they dealt with them. But there was one major consideration that Congress had which simply was not on the screen for the crown. It just wasn't in their mind, and that was the, the equality among the, the colonies. So, for instance, if it behooved the crown to create a very small colony called Rhode Island for religious tolerance, and in doing so, relieve what could be an explosive political problem building in Massachusetts, where they're burning people at the stake over religious issues, it would do that, and it wouldn't be terribly concerned, it wouldn't be concerned at all, in fact, that Rhode Island was so much smaller than Massachusetts or Pennsylvania or, or Virginia. Uh, 
so that the colonies that we inherited from, from England after the Revolution are a great deal more diverse in size than are the states. I do not seem to, but I, must, I must have one of those maps that you all have. <laughs> if not, I'm going to be sunk. Here we go. I got it. If you look at the, 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 the handout you were given, the states that are in color, or I should say the areas that are in color, those are the 13 colonies at the start of the American Revolution, okay? And the reason I put them in color was to show that as diverse as those 13 colonies are in size when you just think of them today, they were even more diverse at the start of the rev Revolution. Uh, uh, Virginia, you know, included three but are now three states. Georgia, what are three states? Massachusetts included Maine. New York, at the start of the revolution, though not by the end, included Vermont. Uh, uh, there was, and, 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 and Rhode Island and, and, and Delaware were teeny. In fact, uh, Rhode Island may have even, well, no, that was a size, yeah, then. So there was this tremendous diversity in size. After the revolution, as your eye kind of goes west on the map, you'll see that doesn't continue. The states are, are much, there's much greater parity. It's not necessarily in stickler miles. In fact, that's only part of it. It would be equality of resources, quality of access to rivers, and quality of uh, uh, the, the uh, arable land and, and things like that. Uh, a couple things happened right after the revolution to try to level the playing field they inherited and to create a more level playing field for the future. And I just want to mention them briefly. The first was Congress created a bicameral legislature, a House and a Senate. This was to try to level the playing field. So that in the House, representation is by population. Therefore, New York would have a whole lot more influence than, say, Rhode Island. But in the Senate, every state gets two votes. Rhode Island is equal then to New York. It mitigates the situation. The other thing Congress did was to urge those states that had colonial claims beyond the Appalachian Mountains, or in the case of Massachusetts with Maine, to cede those lands to the United States to create a greater number of states more equal in size. And as you can see, that ultimately did happen. I should put a footnote here that this sounds just wonderful, everybody working in concert. It didn't happen without conflict, and the motives weren't always so wonderful. Uh, uh, Georgia and Virginia and North Carolina realized that by ceding their Western claims and creating additional states, they would be creating additional votes in the U.S. Senate for slavery. And they were always looking down the pike, worrying that they could eventually be outvoted in the Senate on slavery and that slavery might be outlawed. So there's a dark underside to this as well. Um, uh, so that's element one, then, the, 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 the change from the, the, the monarchy to, to, to the uh, Congress. Uh, a second element that affected a lot of the states was the uh, uh, proposal in 1808 to build an Erie Canal. After the Revolution, when we're no longer part of England, we no longer can be assured of access to the St. Lawrence River, which connects the Great Lakes to the ocean. 1808, the, the Great St. Lawrence is entirely in Canada. It's not our boundary, except for a small part in New York. In 1808, they proposed a canal that would leave Lake Erie roughly at Buffalo, cross the state of New York, connect to the Hudson River, and go down to the ocean. That impacted the uh, at least one boundary for every state in the vicinity of the Great Lakes. So that it changed uh, a, a boundary line for Ohio, for Indiana, for Illinois, for Wisconsin. Michigan indirectly res ended up with that upper peninsula that's not even connected to Michigan. And Minnesota ended up also with land that was not originally part of Minnesota. So the Erie Canal was huge for that region. Not too long later, after that, element three, railroads. When railroads came into, into being as a viable means of, of transportation, rivers became less critical for boundaries. They're still very important as a resource, but it was less critical. And so what you see as your eye scans the map from east to west is those lines start to straighten out. And one of the reasons they can straighten out is that Congress did not have to rely on rivers in the way that the British monarchs did, or the early years of Congress did. Uh, perhaps with the Northwest Territory. Um, uh, and then the fourth uh, element 
And this one's interesting because it bounces in a couple unusual ways, is slavery. Uh, and, and on the map, there's, there are vestiges of the effort by Congress in state boundaries to regulate slavery, but also there are vestiges of the surrender of that effort by Congress. And here's specifically what I mean. After the Louisiana Purchase, the question came up, will there be slavery allowed in, the Louisiana, in this new territory? And it was ultimately resolved when Missouri applied for statehood in what was called the Missouri Compromise. The Missouri Compromise said no new state or territory can have slavery if it is north of 36 degrees, 30 minutes, I'll come back to that line in a moment, with the exception of the state of Missouri, hence the compromise. 36 degrees, 30 minutes is the southern border of Missouri. If you look at the map, you'll see that there are some little exceptions to the rule, because, but basically that line, if you go east, it continues as the boundary between Kentucky and Tennessee and Virginia and North Carolina. It's actually a line that has been with us since colonial times when Queen Anne established, actually it was a revision to the original boundary, but established the boundary of Virginia and North Carolina as being halfway between the Chesapeake Bay and Albemarle Sound. It had nothing to do with slavery at the time. And since both those states had the western claims, it simply continued when they ceded those western claims as the boundary of Kentucky and Tennessee. But then Missouri used it as a convenient southern boundary just crossing the river, but it became significant because of the Missouri Compromise. If you look further to the west, after Oklahoma, you'll see the top of Texas is 36 degrees, 30 minutes. The reason is when Texas applied for statehood in, I believe, 1845, uh, it was a republic, it had slavery, it was a much larger uh, entity than it is today. It included not only the eastern half of New Mexico. If you look on your map, you'll see a blue line going through New Mexico. That's a continuation of the Rio Grande. That was all Texas when it became a state. Uh, and it went up to the red line, which is 3630. Before Texas statehood, the Republic of Texas continued. It narrowed down, but it continued all the way up as far as, as the same latitude as California, all the way up to the 42nd parallel. So it was a much larger republic. And it's, and, and, but it could not keep slavery if it went that far north. So it said, okay, we will give you all our land north of 3630 in order to keep slavery. So that is why the top of Texas is lopped off where it is and why on the map we have this kind of interrupted but long line that goes all the way from Virginia to Texas and it becomes significant in terms of slavery with Missouri, as I say. Before that, it was not significant for slavery. If you look just above Texas, you'll see that there's a line that's the northern border of Oklahoma, more significantly the southern border of Kansas, and that, that line too is pretty long. It continues across Colorado, Utah, at one time it all, went all the way to California uh, as part of that territory. That line represents the surrender by the federal government of the effort to regulate slavery. What am I talking about here? After Texas joined the Union, it triggered the Mexican War, and the Mexican War led to our acquiring a huge amount of land in the West. And again, the question came up, will it be slave land or not? And the South could see that the Missouri Compromise wasn't gonna work anymore. Too much of that land was below 3630. It wouldn't take long before they would get outvoted in the Senate. And so when Kansas applied for statehood, there was a huge dust up across the way here just over there, over whether or not the Missouri Compromise would apply. And ultimately, to make a long story short, Congress said, we're done. We're going to scrap the Missouri Compromise. We're going to take up this idea by Stephen Douglas of popular sovereignty, which means every state or territory will decide for itself whether or not they have slavery. And then the dust settled. But when the dust settled, well, it didn't settle in Kansas. They had a lot of bleeding. They called it bleeding Kansas as they went through their debate about whether or not to in fact have slavery, by the way they chose not to. But when the dust settled on all this, a little shift had happened that went pretty much unnoticed. When Kansas applied for statehood at the very start of this brouhaha, it proposed its southern boundary at 36 degrees, 30 minutes. Made perfect sense. Would have put it right flat with Texas uh, and, uh, and, and Arkansas, Missouri's line. When Congress finally passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854, it had shifted the southern boundary of Kansas 
one half of one degree to the north to 37 degrees. That created a gap. That gap is the Oklahoma panhandle. But 37 degrees was the beginnings of a new approach or a, uh, a, a newly minted approach by Congress for future states. Because by placing it at 37 degrees and not longer having to worry about slavery, Congress could now be much more mathematical in its creation of states. And it could create a tier of prairie states from Kansas to Canada having exactly three degrees of height, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, and North Dakota. And just to the west, it could create a tier of mountainous states starting at 37 degrees, having, because it was not as good for agriculture, they gave it four degrees of height, Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana. Six of the western states have either exactly or very close to exactly, if they happen to be on the West Coast, seven degrees of width. And in creating this prototype, they were, in my view, they were mirroring a prototype that goes all the way back to Thomas Jefferson when he was asked to propose boundaries for what was called the Northwest Territories, the, 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 uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, that area that we had acquired with the British and the French and Indian War and was part of this country at the outset. And they said, Jefferson, how do we do this? How are we going to make these states? And he wrote a report to Congress. One part of the report said, by the way, here's what I think the line should be. And he had a whole bunch of states having two degrees of height and four degrees of width. Congress didn't follow it, but they followed the principle that all states should be created equal. And then later, when they really had a clean slate to work with, they really followed the idea of a prototype. Uh, so those are, are four key elements. Uh, that, that, that determine where a lot of the boundaries have ended up on the map. The last thing I want to say is just that uh, for me, when I set out to do this, the map of the 48 states particularly, as I suspect for many of you, <clears throat> was so, so familiar that all these lines just seemed to me as much a part of nature as the rivers and the mountain crests. Having gone through this whole process, for me now the map is permanently changed and it's a mural. It's an incredible mural of a wide swath of American history. And with its, uh, the nuances and the exceptions and the, 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 the this is and that uh, of the American character and, 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 and the way it, it, the various aspects that it has had. So I'm happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Northwest end mm -hmm. into Pennsylvania. Yeah. Sure. That I, I love that arc. That arc, <laughs> thinking in terms of Pennsylvania, uh, which is the reason for the arc, that arc inscribes in the shape of Pennsylvania its Quaker past. Uh, uh, when the reason, by the way, we have Delaware, just to start with, with, <laughs> and we'll get to the arc, is that the Dutch, at the time that these colonies were created, were one of the colonial powers in North America, the English, the Dutch, the French, the Spanish. Uh, we think of the Dutch in New York primarily, but in fact, the Dutch settlements began all the way down in what is now Delaware, along the Delaware Bay. They expand, extended up through Pennsylvania along the Delaware River and into New Jersey on the other side of the Delaware River and then into New York and so forth. So the, the, there was a whole long swath of the Dutch. When the king gave to the Penn family Pennsylvania, the charter for Pennsylvania, he knew the Penns were Quakers, and the Quakers are pacifists. And the Crown was never looking for trouble if it could avoid the trouble. And he knew that if he drew the southern boundary of Pennsylvania straight, it would put into Pennsylvania a somewhat significant Dutch settlement at Newcastle. And he knew he could not count on the, on the Pennsylvania Quakers to go to the mat over this land in the way that he knew that. that Oglethorpe in Georgia would go to the mat with Spain and did. But he knew that the, the Quakers would not. And so he said, okay, okay, we're not gonna get, we're not gonna go there. We're gonna draw a circle, 12 mile semicircle around Newcastle. And that will not be part of the colony of Pennsylvania. So that's where what appears to be Delaware's semicircle is actually in some ways Pennsylvania's semicircle. Why does West Virginia have that center from Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
This is the, this is this little finger of uh, West Virginia that that sticks up between Ohio and Pennsylvania. Uh, the first thing to, to 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 keep in mind is that at the time that that finger was surfaced on the map, West Virginia was part of Virginia, uh, and at that point, actually going back even before that a little bit, into the point where we're still colonial times, after the uh, French and Indian War, we acquired, as I just said, Ohio, Indiana, all the, war, all, the, all the areas between the Ohio River there and the Mississippi, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, the British acquired, with the help of the American colonists. And then they said to the American colonists, but you are not allowed to settle that land, which really angered the colonists as much as the Stamp Act. But the British knew that if the colonists started expanding westward, they were just gonna, they were already getting too powerful. So they were, they were wrestling with this. The colonists were so angry that England said, okay, 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 we'll work out a whole deal here. You can sell warrants to that land, investments, you can form corporations and sell it, but you can't occupy it yet. Land along the Ohio River. And so Virginia sold the land along the Ohio, I was talking to the man next to you, here, uh, along the Ohio River. Uh, it was part of the reason that Virginia gave Kentucky to the U.S. It didn't give West Virginia. That didn't happen until the Civil War because of those, those, those land investments and that access through the Ohio River to the Mississippi, to the Gulf, to the ocean. It was an important avenue for commerce uh, it, after the Revolution. Uh, uh, so that's why Virginia held on to that. Then, at the same time, there was this question of where the western boundary of Pennsylvania would be. The British, uh, the colonial charter said it would be five uh, degrees west of its eastern boundary. Its eastern boundary was the uh, Delaware River. It's not a straight line. So where on the Delaware River? So there was, first of all, there was bloodshed between the, the uh, Pennsylvanians and the uh, 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 Virginians before the revolution and there was continued conflict after as to where that western boundary between their two colonies, later states, was. Eventually, shortly after the revolution, there was a, with Pennsylvania, a kind of a massive negotiation that involved New York and Pennsylvania. Uh, 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 the Erie Canal figured into it, which is why, by the way, Pennsylvania has a little tab sticking up on Lake Erie. And once they did that, they could agree to where the western boundary would be. Uh, uh, which happens to be five degrees west of the latitude where the Delaware River crosses the boundary of Maryland or something, well, I, some little formula. But it resulted then in this little finger of land that Virginia was still going to hold on to because it, it, it at that point in time, wanted, needed the river so much. Uh, the boundary, by the way, between uh, Kentucky and West Virginia and again, that's really the boundary between Kentucky and what had been Virginia, is the Big Sandy River and uh, 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 Tug Fork. Uh, and again, those lead to the Ohio and to the west, to the Mississippi and down. Commerce in these western areas, to get it to the ocean, those waterways were, were before railroads, very important. And in mountainous areas, even after railroads, it remained uh, very important. Uh, in the west, we have some red lines here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. The, uh, the, the ones that are in Nevada uh, uh, actually represent the previous western boundaries of Utah. Now, when I, when I say the boundaries are changing, I'm always talking about territorial boundaries. Once you become a state, Congress cannot change your, your boundary without your consent. There have been some changes under those terms, but, th th but these are territorial. I said earlier that... Uh, Congress operated under the principle that all states should be created equal. There was one exception to that, and that was Utah, because Utah was Mormon, and Congress didn't trust the Normans, Mormons. This is in the years particularly leading up to the Civil War. They worried about their, their uh, 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 loyalty to the, to, to the federal government uh, because of uh, conflicts they'd had with them in Illinois with uh, 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 state law and polygamy and issues such as that. Uh, when the Mormons left Illinois, they went out to the Great Salt Lake, and uh, after the Mexican War, the Utah Territory was created, virtually all Mormon territory. And its original western boundary was that farther west red line. 
And then they discovered, I believe it was gold. It might have been silver, but I believe it was gold. And so right before they created the state of Nevada, which was created, I believe, first, uh, uh, they said, you know what, we're going to give Nevada an extra degree of longitude, give them the gold. And then they discovered, again, right before uh, uh, statehood, that, oh, there's, there's, there are some water uh, uh, resources here. And we didn't fully realize that they could connect us to the Colorado River and transport down. And so we're going to give another degree of longitude to Nevada. And so Congress twice s sliced down Utah, and those were the lines to do it. Um, a number of the things that the reviews about the books, good one, about this book, have said, that, and they're even the good reviews, that the bite taken out of Utah by Wyoming was also part of this effort to diminish Utah. I don't think it was. It actually happened a little later. And more to the point that if you look at a topographic map of that northeast corner of Utah, there are some mountains that form exactly that right angle. Had Utah been given the, the right angle, they would have jurisdiction over land. They'd have to cross mountains to get to it. Not easy. Whereas for Wyoming, they're right in there. I'm sure it didn't help them that they were Mormons, but uh, uh, I don't think it, at that point that, it, that the issues, this was post-Civil War, I believe, were quite as strong. But those are what those red lines are. Uh, did, were you asking us about the Montana one? Or? Yeah. Okay. Montana, there are two places on the map where I like to say that it embeds the idea that this is the land of opportunity, where one person can make a difference, for better or for worse. In the case of Montana, the red line is showing you the crest of the Rocky Mountains, the Continental Divide. And when uh, Idaho went for statehood, that was the proposed boundary for Ohio Idaho. It would be the crest of the, uh, of the Rockies. And, you know, hey, it looks to me like it makes sense. You know, otherwise Idaho is kind of weird. But the year before statehood, when Idaho was a, still a territory, a former congressman named Sidney Edgerton went out to be a federal judge in Idaho territory. The territorial governor gave him a district east of the Rockies, which was like nowhere. And he was really angry. So when a year later, Idaho went for statehood, Sidney Edgerton came to Washington as part of Montana's delegation. He knew a lot of congressmen. He knew the president. And he had $2,000 in gold in his baggage. And he managed to get Congress to move the boundary west to the crest of the Bitterroot Mountains. And that's the line you see today for Idaho. It starts to, to, to taper off. If Edgerton got everything he wanted, which was to stick with the Bitterroots, Idaho would actually taper, taper off to a point. But in fact, he didn't quite get everything he wanted, which is why at the very top, there's a straight line for Idaho, a little tab. That's giving Idaho one little resource called the Kootenai River Valley. Up there in the mountains, there's a little bit of an agricultural area uh, made by, this, by the Kootenai River. Um, but that's, that's what the red line in, in Mon Montana is. I uh, uh, grew up in the California Nevada area. Mm -hmm. Well, in a way, it, it does, uh, in that uh, uh, I actually should probably take this opportunity to talk about California altogether, and Texas, in a sense, and, 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 and remind me if I don't come back to that eastern boundary. Uh, the, you know, I say all states should be created equal. Well, what about Texas and, and, and California? Uh, Texas, just to touch on it real quickly, because I've virtually done it already, Congress didn't create Texas. Texas created itself. It was a republic when it came in, Congress tried very hard to get Texas down to size, if you will. Uh, they did see the northern land, and uh, uh, its northern holdings, as I said. Uh, in 1850, when they were so deeply in debt from their days as a republic, Congress purchased from Texas all the land east of the uh, Rio Grande there in New Mexico to that boundary line that is now the western border of Texas, which reduced the size of Texas even more. There's more to that story, but I won't go into that one right now. It also had said to Texas upon becoming a state, hey, you can divide, if you wish, into as many as five separate states. And this is 1845, pre-Civil War. The fellow slave states said, do it, do it, do it. That's 10 pro-slavery votes. Up north, where they were proclaiming all men are created equal, eh, they weren't so crazy about all states being created equal, because one big Texas is just two votes. As it turned out, Texas 
from its, uh, this is my guess, from its uh, uh, experiences together getting uh, independence from Mexico and struggling as a republic, that they have, and still to this day, have a kind of unique sense of themselves. And they were not about to divide into five states. So <laughs> they said no. And, and so we have a very big Texas, and, and the South lost uh, quite a few potential votes uh, for slavery. California, we got what is now California, that, the land in part of the Mexican War. That was in 1848. And this is really amazing to follow the timeline on this. In one year, probably, in fact, a little less than a year, gold was discovered, and so many people rushed to this area around the San Francisco Bay and up into the mountains that before Congress had time to create a territorial government, California created its own. And it sent to Congress proposals, we're moving closer to that eastern boundary, for borders for its state. To call it a proposal is to, is to put it nicely, it was a take it or leave it proposition. <laughs> Uh, uh, there's a speech that uh, Senator Seward, William Seward of New York, later the Secretary of State for Lincoln, gave that I quote in the book, where he says on the Senate, the fellow senators essentially says, look, I don't like this any more than you do, but what can we do? Suppose California says, well, we'll just become a nation. Let's try and stop us. We can't get our army across the Rockies. We can't get our navy around the bottom of South America. There was no Panama Canal at the time. They have so much gold in their hills they can secure credit for their new country. And are we so naive as to think that other countries would not immediately recognize this new country if only to stop the growth of the United States? And so we got to take the deal. And we did. Part of what, you, were you the man who asked the question? Yeah. Uh, part of that deal that, that, that Congress really didn't like, in addition to just the size, was that eastern border. That eastern border encompasses all of the Sierra Nevada mountains. That's where the gold was. That's, California was basically saying, oh, by the way, all the gold is ours. <laughs> and Congress said, OK, look, how about we just move the border back a little to the crest of the mountains? And, and California, which was a state by then, said, no, we're keeping our border. So in a sense, it did have to do with the topographical feature in that it was saying, we'll take the whole topographical feature unlike uh, most mountainous areas where, where, particularly in the east, the, the mountain crest became the, the, uh, the boundary. Uh, the logic, or I don't know if it's logic so much as, as uh, kind of the, just the uh, prototype that California worked after, or the, or the math was that the state would be, I believe it was 215, approximately 215 miles wide, and that the eastern boundary would follow, in a general sense, the west coast of the, of the state at a distance of uh, 215 miles, more or less. So uh, that was the logic of that, of that particular boundary line. Can you talk about um, the Yeah. yeah. Um, can you talk about the Michigan uh, border? It looks like there's two parts. Right? Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, the, the Michigan, indeed, is in two parts. There is uh, the, the, what they call the mitt sometimes, and then there's this upper peninsula that isn't attached to Michigan. The Upper Peninsula was a consolation prize to Michigan for problems, for, 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 for disputes it lost at the other end, at the southern end of Michigan. <clears throat> and they relate, in turn, to the uh, uh, Erie Canal. When that canal became a possibility, at that point, Thomas Jefferson's line for that region, remember I said he had drawn those lines? One of his lines was an east-west line that went to the southern, along the southernmost tip of Lake Michigan. Uh, and that was still in use at the time of the Indiana t Territory, in the Illinois Territory. Uh, Indi that gave Indiana one infinitely small point of access to Lake Michigan, which was now no longer a lake. It was a vital highway to the Erie Canal. So Indiana, when it came for statehood, said, you got to give us some frontage on Lake Michigan, and Congress said, we'll give you 10 miles, and they moved the northern border of Indiana 10 miles up. That gave them a port at Gary, Indiana. Ohio has plenty of frontage, Ohio being the other southern state, the, the southern border of Michigan, has plenty of frontage on a great lake, it's, it's Lake Erie, but that line of Jefferson's cut off Ohio from the port that is the end of a m long river, goes through the whole western part of Ohio, called the Maumee, and it empties into Lake Erie at Toledo. And Ohio, when it came for stage, it said, hey, you, you gotta give us the port at Toledo. And Congress said, okay, 
For you, we will draw a line from the top of Toledo toward the very bottom of Lake Michigan that will stop, of course, the Indiana line. So one thing that explains is why the boundaries of Indiana and Ohio there are not one straight line, but actually two slightly offset segments. Meanwhile, Michigan says, it's still a territory, are we chopped liver? You're just taking our land, some of our best land, some of our best access, and you're giving it away. And there was what they called the Toledo War, where uh, it wasn't really a war in the way that some of these other disputes were wars, but there was one death where involving, this would involve harassing the surveyors when they were doing the lines, and the one death may have been a barroom brawl, may have been part of the thing, may have been a brawl that had to do with you know, the surveying, but it was getting heated enough that Congress intervened and said, okay, look, look, how about we give you this peninsula of land up there? And that was part of Wisconsin, but no one's living there right now. No one's going to complain. <laughs> take it. And Michigan said, we'll take it. And so Michigan got its upper peninsula. Uh, Wisconsin really just didn't have enough population to, to raise an issue about it. Uh, and, uh, and in return, uh, Indiana and Ohio got the access they needed at those locations to ports on the Great Lake. Mm -hmm. Looking on a map, it's, it's a very small portion of Kentucky on the west side that mm -hmm. uh, doesn't actually connect to the west of Kentucky. Yeah, yeah it's called the Kentucky Bend. Um, I was just looking this up this morning. Uh, Kentucky uh, became a, a state, uh, um, well, before 1811, I know, it's, uh, 1790s, I think. In 1811 and 12, there were a series of tremendous earthquakes in that part of the country, particularly in the boot heel of M Missouri, and it changed the flow of the Mississippi River and created the Kentucky Bend. Um, no one paid too much attention to it at the time in terms of Kentucky's line because uh, it was Indian land still uh, until uh, the Jackson Purchase. Kentucky and Tennessee have a, have a long troubled, disputed history in their, in their boundaries. Uh, if you look at the western end of Kentucky, you can see there's a little heel that digs down into Tennessee. That's actually where the line should have been all across the state. That's 36 degrees, uh, yeah, 30 minutes, as it would be uh, correctly surveyed, but it, it had gotten way off course. And there were lots of disputes. So there was a lot of bad blood. And when they surveyed and they got to the Mississippi River. They said, okay, here's the end of Kentucky. The Kentuckians said, no, no, no. It goes to the western end of the, you know, it ends where the Mississippi ends. That line should continue. And so they could make that case. And so this little section of Kentucky, you can't see it on this map. The boundary continues even though the Mississippi loops up and back and basically cuts it off from the rest of the state. If you want to get from the at region of Kentucky, to the rest of Kentucky, you either have to swim the Mississippi, because I don't think there's a bridge, or drive down into Tennessee and come up. In fact, the kids who live in that area go to Tennessee schools. Um, I think a woman over here had a, yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, I was wondering about Alabama and um, Mississippi looking so much alike. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Twins. Yeah. And I, I, I should have also mentioned, uh, by the way, uh, when on the, the colors on the, the map, for one, the uh, colonies at the time of the revolution, you'll notice that Alabama and Mississippi don't have their tabs at the bottom. And the tabs are part of, today, part of that mirror image, by the way. Well, that's because at that time they were not part of uh, uh, Kentucky and uh, a part of the Georgia colony. Uh, they were part of Florida, which was a Spanish uh, holding until 1818. Um, the, 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 uh, the mirror images is really very much reflecting that notion of states being created equal. Uh, so that uh, uh, you have this Georgia colony, the area in green, and Georgia can't really cede its land west of the Appalachians because the Appalachians end in northern Georgia. There ain't no more Appalachians. So Georgia came up with a little different formula that followed the principle using, I believe it's the Chattahoochee River, uh, to create the state of Georgia and then to create uh, what was first called the Mississippi Territory, which is now Mississippi and Alabama. Um, and we also seized from Spain in two separate incidents the land that became the Tabs. 
When they divided Mississippi and Alabama, the idea was to try to create three states, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, that are all roughly equal in size. Uh, Georgia actually is, tends to be is a little bit bigger, but you know they were the big brother, so they, they got a little more of the share. But, but the reason for the mirror image line is that. And then within that, the line that divides them, there's a bend in that line. Why not just have a straight line? Um, the reason was that, that the, the most valuable land in, 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 in Mississippi and Alabama is the southern land, the bottom land. Further north, it gets mountainous, not as good for agriculture, and particularly down in that region that we took from Spain. Uh, there were some disputes between the two states as to where it should be, but Congress just stepped in and said, here's what we're going to do. We are going to do a north-south line that divides the southern tier of the Mississippi Territory through that land we, we acquired from, Sp from Spain, and it will go as far as the northwest corner of what was then Washington County, Mississippi. And at that point, the line will then proceed to the center point between the Mississippi River and the Georgia border. So that's why it bends. If, it, if, it, if they had used just the bottom line, the north-south line, the states wouldn't be equal. If they had used just the main line, the two r richest areas of agriculture wouldn't be equal. So it was, they bent it to try to do the maximum equality. By the way, there's a little interesting tab up in the northwest corner of Alabama. They depart from the straight line. You can barely see it on this map, but it's there. That's the Tennessee River. The reason they followed the Tennessee River was, had they simply continued the line to Tennessee, the straight line, they would have created an island of jurisdiction for Mississippi, whereby Mississippi would have had to cross the Tennessee River, which is pretty wide, to have jurisdiction. To, to, have law enforcement in that little piece of land. Very often when that happened, Congress would, would, would not do that and they would, they would have a little, a little tab. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, you're asking about one of my favorite borders, and it looks so innocuous on the map today, the northern border of Missouri. Uh, uh, the first, there were several proposals uh, from different groups within Missouri for statehood boundaries, and the initial ones all placed the boundary, uh, I don't have the figure with me here, I think it was three and a half degrees uh, north of the uh, boundary with Arkansas. I think that might be right. It was not up there where it is now, but when they, the uh, official boundary proposal was made in the final one, they followed a line called the um, Sullivan Line, which is the boundary. Uh, f first, just in general, Missouri is too big, isn't it? I mean, uh, the, uh, one other thing about Missouri. When it first became a state, do you see the straight line western border of Missouri? That line continued all the way up to Iowa. That triangle of land that continues now in Missouri was not originally part of Missouri. In fact, we had just negotiated with the Indians and for that region to give them that land for something else that we had taken. After one year of statehood, Missouri said, we want that uh, triangle too. And Congress said, okay. And I mean, so where does this come from that Missouri is like, you know, elbowing out? Uh, if you look at the bottom of Missouri, it's got a boot heel sticking into Arkansas. It's another one of these individual things. What's, what's with Missouri? What's with Missouri is the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi River at St. Louis. That is one powerful economic resource. So that Missouri, while all states should be created equal, in fact, Missouri is a little more equal, much as New York is with the Hudson and the Erie Canal, because it could be, because it possessed this extraordinary valuable resource, particularly in a country that at the time feared civil war and the loss of that resource. So answer number one is Missouri got this northern border that's really too far north, surveyed by a guy named John C. Sullivan. Uh, and in fact, even that line, I don't know if you can quite tell it on this map, but as it gets east toward uh, the Mississippi River, it starts to veer too far north. It's no longer straight. It veers a little north. It was inaccurately surveyed. Uh, 
Iowa challenged that boundary. They challenged, they couldn't challenge its location because Missouri was already a state, but they challenged the inaccuracy of the survey compared to, the, to what he was claimed he did. But what no one could figure out was who told Sullivan to do it, <laughs> which is why I asked my wife to get me rules governing public land surveys in Iowa. It was for that very line. And in that book is where I found that Iowa, at one point, I think it was in 1838, wrote to what is today the Army Corps of Engineers. At the time, it was just a division in the Army that did this surveying, and said, who, who told Sullivan to draw that line? Uh, 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 and, and they wrote back and they said, well, all we know is it was a, uh, William Rector, uh, who was the uh, head of uh, surveying at the time, but we don't know why. So I looked up William Rector. Well, first of all, he was General Rector at the time. He was part of the Army. And he was dismissed from the Army for incompetence and nepotism. <laughs> so there could have been shady dealings there. Uh, and at least I haven't been able to, to unearth them, I'm, if, they're, if they're even around to be seen. The other boundary, though, has a more the northern boundary of Iowa with Minnesota. And the fact that Minnesota seems outsized is a different story. Minnesota, if you look at a map, the northern part of it is all these lakes, it, it, particularly in the, uh, it, at that time, just didn't appear to be land that would be very valuable for agriculture uh, or, or other resources. So even, even Jefferson in this map made Minnesota, what he, I think he had a different name for it, but made that region a little larger. Uh, the reason for the southern boundary, the one with Iowa, is that at that line, virtually all the waterways north of that line lead to the Minnesota River so that the watershed goes toward the Minnesota River. And below that line, the watersheds go to the Mississippi River. Uh, some, of, some of Minnesota's watersheds go also to the Mississippi. But, but for the Minnesota River, they're all north of that line. So there was a, a, a topographical reason, for I think, for the location on, on that line. Talking about the North, I can tell you that's false. Uh, no, no state would accept a boundary that was surveyed for that reason. You're talking about the North Carolina, South Carolina boundary? That boundary is uh, uh, just, a, I don't know if we want to say it's a comedy of errors. Depends on which side of the line you're on, I guess. Uh, uh, it was one error after another. It probably would take me too long, and I'd mess it up anyway to try to, to recount them. But uh, initially, the boundary was supposed to be the Cape Fear River. Then it had turned out that North Carolina had already deeded land along the Cape Fear. So Queen Anne relocated it uh, some given number of miles below the Cape Fear River. It was supposed to proceed in parallel northwest to the 35th degree of latitude. They did that, but they missed the 35th degree of latitude by like 12 or 13 miles. And so the next time when they surveyed further west, they said, okay, well, we'll correct it. And so you start getting these, these, these dips uh, and movements. There was also an Indian reservation, a Catawba reservation. It's one of the few times we respected an Indian boundary in drawing a, a state line. So that on a map that would have to be a little better than this one, well, you can almost see it. There's a little teeny right angle before the curve area in the west. That's going around the Catawba reservation at that time, much smaller than it had been, and then following certain branches of a river to finally get uh, to the uh, crest of the Appalachians and, and, to, and to follow that. But no, uh, there, there's a similar story about uh, a, a segment of the um, uh, North Carolina uh, border that it takes a sudden straight line south to Georgia. And the story is that they were in the mountains so long they really wanted a tavern. Uh, <laughs> and so they went straight to Georgia. Uh, the fact is they were in the middle of moonshine country and uh, didn't need a tavern. and. Uh, their journals reveal that they didn't need any other services either. They were, they were all provided for. I noticed that the uh, eastern tip of West Virginia in this map is blue, indicating it would be part of Maryland. Yeah, that is uh, my inability to click correctly. That should be orange. Yeah. Can you talk about the boundary between Virginia and Maryland? Virginia and Maryland? Yeah. yeah. Well, the boundary is uh, from the uh, colonial charter of Maryland is the Potomac River. And all of the Potomac River is Maryland under that boundary. 
Uh, one problem is that it didn't stipulate whether, because they didn't know about it then, the North Branch or the South Branch would be considered the, the Potomac River further out. Uh, it is, in fact, the North Branch, even though the South Branch is larger and therefore, by tradition, would have been the, the Potomac River, but Virginia was an older, richer colony, deeded that land to people like Lloyd Fairfax. No way was Maryland going to win that battle. Um, uh, the uh, one, one effect of that is that in today in Washington, D.C., which is the remainder of Maryland's half of the land it gave to create the city, uh, the Potomac River in Washington is entirely under the jurisdiction of Washington, D.C. That's why you'll see D.C. police boats out there. It's why when I crossed the chain bridge not long ago and there was an accident, a D.C. cop was in the middle of the bridge moving traffic. Sir, I think you had a question. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, it's actually two different answers because one, you're dealing with an international boundary and some other issues. But in the case of the Mississippi, also the Missouri River, um, and the Ohio River, uh, and probably some others, they have sh either shifted course or had their course shifted to make them more straight for shipping, or through events there has been accretion and the river has changed. But in those instances, the boundary remains the original boundary of the state. I had a, was on a call-in show and a man called in and said he was in southern Illinois with his brother hunting, and a sheriff came up and said, you can't hunt here. And he said, no, sheriff, here's our, here's our license. He said, well, that's an Illinois license. And he said, well, he said, you're in Missouri. He said, well, the Mississippi River's over there. And he said, well, it wasn't always over there. And this, <laughs> and this is still Missouri. And if you take a close look, in fact, if there's a second edition or in the paperback, if they'll let me do it, I, I want to call more attention to that, that there are boundaries where the river has shifted. Now, the Rio Grande gets more complicated because we entered into a number of agreements with Mexico, and, and also there was man-made interference with for shipping along the Rio Grande uh, around uh, 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 El Paso, I know. Um, so it, it gets more complicated, and, and frankly, more complicated and detailed than this book even would attempt to, 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 to piece out when you have a, that issue with an international border. One more question. Well, M Maryland's colonial charter, every boundary in it was contested, and every contest Maryland lost. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the Mason-Dixon line, first of all, the Mason-Dixon line is not simply the boundary between Maryland and Pennsylvania. It also takes a right turn and becomes the boundary between Maryland and Delaware, and then takes a left turn and remains, is also part of that, that Maryland-Delaware boundary. They surveyed all of that. Um, but they came in a little bit later. Uh, Maryland's uh, boundary, northern border, according to its charter, was 40 degrees north latitude. It's great. It's right through the middle of Philadelphia, as it turns out. <laughs> you you got to cut them some slack that back then they didn't always know just where in the world they, they were. I mean, it, it was hard. So Pennsylvania definitely wanted to enter into negotiations with Maryland. The, 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 the negotiations got a little complicated because once the British ousted the Dutch authorities from here, Delaware, Maryland claimed Delaware because it was within its charter uh, boundaries also. Maryland was a Catholic colony. Delaware did not, was Protestant, Dutch Protestants. They did not want to be part of a Catholic colony. Keep in mind, they're not only burning the witches in, New, in Massachusetts, there's a king of England who lost his head over religious issues. Catholics and, and Protestants were killing each other at that time in much of Europe and in England in particular. So there was significant fear by Delaware that they wouldn't want to be part of, of Maryland. Meanwhile, Pennsylvania, of all places, wants to claim Delaware. Where do they come off? Well, they come off because if Delaware is not somehow under their control, there could be landlocked. Their, con their access from the Pencil Del Delaware River into Delaware Bay could be cut off. Uh, so there's a long negotiation, okay? 
And at one point, Lloyd Baltimore is in London, going through it again with the Pennsylvania representatives. And he finds that they're pretty amenable to his recommendation. He's recommending a border at Cape Henlopen as the southern border of, of, of uh, Delaware. And they're saying, fine. What he didn't, and so he said fine to their northern border. Uh, and what he didn't realize was that his map was wrong. <laughs> and where it showed Cape Henlopen was really Fenwick Island, uh, which is, in fact, the boundary between the two. And where he gave them the northern border, though he didn't know it, I don't know if he ever knew it, further west, he almost cut his state off in two. But finally they had an agreement, and even when he realized his mistake and said, let's have a do-over, the Crown said, forget it, we're done, and let's get the two finest surveyors in England to come out and, and, and do this line once and for all so there will be no more mistakes. And they got, I have their names, their first names here, uh, Charles Mason and Jeremiah. Dixon to come out and do the line. They also had to resolve some contradictions in the stipulations for the Delaware border that simply physically couldn't be done, but they, they minimized uh, the, those, those, those contradictions. So that's where it did. It had nothing to do, by the way, with slavery, the Mason-Dixon line. Nothing to do with slavery whatsoever. Well, thank you all very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.